Good morning again, everyone. Welcome to uh, the colloquium. Uh, my name is Sean DeShields. I am a faculty member at the Bermuda College. I'm here and I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished keynote address speaker. Uh, uh, the speaker, Dr. Tyron Douglas, assistant professor in the Department of Education Leadership and Policy Analysis at the University of Missouri. He is going to be speaking to this morning about border crossing brothers, black males navigating race, place, and complex space. He's sponsored by the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement, University of Austin, Texas. A little information about uh, Dr. Douglas. As an assistant professor in the Department of Education Leadership and Policy Analysis at the University of Missouri, he was born and raised in Bermuda. Uh, he's son of the soil. He worked, his work is, explores the intersections between identity, community space, for example, barbershops, sports fields, and churches, and the social cultural foundations of leadership and education. The author of three books, including The New Project, which is commenced in October 2016, uh, Border Crossing Brothers, Black Males Navigating Race, Place, and Complex Space. Douglas offers high impact, high energy presentations that draw on his work in college and professional athletics. Black male success, black family studies, diversity and equity, critical spirituality, leadership, teaching, and learning. Dr. Douglas has delivered keynote motivational talks and lectures in Africa, Europe, Bermuda, Brazil, the Caribbean, and the United States. His most recent speaking events included sharing the stage with well-renowned motivational speaker, E.T., the hip-hop preacher, and speaking for the NCAA drawings on his 2015 NCAA Grant Fund study report on black males student athletes. A proud graduate of Bermuda College, Dr. Douglas is a border crossing brother scholar who operationalizing his scholarships for maximizing community impact. The co-author of a new special issue with Dr. Shazir Warren and Tyrone C. Howard on My Brother's Keeper Initiative in Teaching Colleges record Dr. Douglas' work is truly crossing borders. One last note about Dr. Douglas. We share a very uh, common mentor that I don't think he realizes. Uh, Someone he has dedicated his book to, uh, that would be our late departed and great Barry Richardson, who was a real mentor for myself, and I'm sure he was a mentor for you. Welcome, sir, and looking forward to your presentation. Blue Water, Island Living in Bermuda. But what about Ferguson? I ain't scared to die, man. Baltimore. Now St. Paul, Minnesota. Baton Rouge. Few projects connect the identities, success, and post-colonial dreams of black males across the diaspora. But some of us have no choice. I didn't know my biological father. I get what it's like to feel like I'm not good enough. With a PhD. But I want to challenge you that we no longer look at the headlines and suggest, oh, well, what's wrong with that person? He's got millions. How can he throw it all away for a joint? Or, well, there's some reasons, perhaps. Born and raised in Bermuda, as my British sounding accent suggests, that I could have been raised on the same streets and school system as Mike Brown. My biological father and grandparents rest in graves in St. Louis. So how did I end up as a professor at the flagship university of my father's state? Grace. The village. A mom who kept me. A dad who chose me. And the educational pathway that said that I could and must cross borders. But this book, it's not really about me. It's about black males like me. Familiar, but all too foreign, perhaps. The voices, that is, of truth and triumph, hope and healing, adversity and advocacy. It's about spaces of healing and education, like the barbershop, the church, the neighborhood, the soccer club. It's about educators and leaders, inside and outside the schoolhouse, who make the difference. It's about the people who believe in the success of our sons, uncles, fathers, students. It's about black males navigating race, place, and complex space. 
Border Crossing Brothers. Good morning, everyone. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Mr. Shields for the introduction. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I'll be honest with you, I actually was, was quite moved by the, uh, the acknowledgement of my Uncle Barry. Uh, and so this morning, I actually stand here representing many men, men whose voices perhaps have not been heard. And so I feel honored and privileged to be here. Men like my Uncle Barry, men like uh, Lewis Thomas, brilliant men who are carpenters and leaders in our community. And so I'm excited to be here uh, to share with you uh, what I believe is going to be an exciting uh, and powerful presentation, not because it's about me, but because it's about men just like many of us in this room. My name is Dr. Ty Douglas. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Missouri uh, in the Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis Department. And this project, or this presentation, is actually based on a book that was released last night. I was humbled and honored to be able to share this with the people. Uh, I was here in spirit. I know you had a wonderful time here as well. Uh, and I look forward to connecting with my colleagues who have been here uh, over the last two days. Uh, the title of the book and this presentation is Border Crossing Brothers, Black Males Navigating Race, Place, and Complex Space. How, ma how many of you would agree with me that we are living in complex times? Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that context matters. You know, I am a professor at the University of Missouri. I'm an hour and 45 minutes from Ferguson. Now I'm 45 minutes from St. Louis, and I'll be honest with you, it, it, it impacts my work. I think about where I am as it relates to proximity and how it impacts my perspective. As was mentioned in, in the introduction, I've had the opportunity to do work uh, that was actually sponsored by an NCAA grant to look at the educational experiences and uh, life experiences of black male student athletes at the University of Missouri. And I was collecting data in 2015, all of last year, so you can imagine um, the, the, the experience that I've had interacting with our young black males, many of whom you saw on ESPN as campus uh, tensions rose to a head last year. I had the opportunity also uh, to work with many students who were leaders uh, on the movements on campus. In fact, my department, if you will, was the, the incubator, I believe, uh, in our college for many of the key student leaders who you saw uh, make national headlines. So I find myself in complex space. But the reality is that that is not new. You've been to my island now. How do you like that pink sand and blue water? What do you think about that? Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Bermuda's an interesting space. Would you agree? All right? 21 square miles of beauty. You can see the water from everywhere. Two or maybe, maybe two miles at its, wildest, at its widest point. And so I've always thought about space in a local context, but also in a global context. In this presentation, I hope that we can push each other to begin to think about the realities that we see, not just in Baltimore or Baton Rouge, but in Bermuda and Bahamas and Barbados, to begin to think more diasporically as it relates to the realities that we are seeing in our schools and in our communities. And so I want you to think about Bermuda as a, a case study, if you will, and the 12 black Bermudian males that share their amazing journeys in this book. They are every man in many ways, and so I think we have a lot to learn from them. Bermuda is still a colony of England, right? You know that now. Um, you've heard perhaps an accent that you maybe have never heard before, except if you in interacted with me, some of my colleagues. You also recognize as you got on Delta Airlines or American Airlines that you didn't fly south, did you? You actually flew, what's that? Easterly, right? That we are 600 miles off the coast of North Carolina. We are actually not really uh, geographically a part of the, of the Caribbean. And so this project really pushed me to think about as I reflect on our colonial context of being a, a colony of England with our British sounding accent and our tea and <laughs> the folks that, things that we enjoy, right? <laughs> but I also thought about it in the context of being 600 miles from North Carolina and the fact that our media, we are inundated with U.S. media. We, many of us are, are sometimes even more American than we are British, but then you also have a faction of our community who are very much Caribbean. We love Bob Marley and soca music, right? And when we're ready, we love to claim our Caribbean heritage. And I began to reflect on what does that mean also for our Africanness in this context, in this unique space. So I want to ask you a question. This, I'm a teacher. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a leader. I'm a teacher. And so this is going to be an interactive presentation. I want to ask you a question. What do you see in this picture? Feel free to just shout it out. What do you see in this picture? What do you see? Talk to me real quick. What do you see? Shout it out. Come on, we're in class. Talk to me. Say it again. Baseball diamond. What else do you see? Lights, a football field, some type of field. 
Neighborhood, good, good. Houses, okay. Question, where was this picture taken? Take a guess. Okay, the, uh, Mr. Mustin said not in Bermuda. Why not, Mr. Mustin? Why is that? Great, 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 great assessment. Ah, that's a football administrator. He said he thinks he knows most of the fields, and that's not one of our fields. Maybe for an astute uh, uh, student who's looking at this, you'll perhaps look at the roofs and notice that they're probably, probably a little bit different from our Bermudian roofs. Uh, how about the, the, the baseball diamond? Does that give anything away? This is not my first colloquium. I uh, was at another colloquium in St. Thomas. And this picture is actually taken in St. Thomas. And when I went into that space and I saw beautiful black and brown people who were navigating that complex space, I began to also assess the spaces that I study, like barbershops and sports clubs and neighborhoods. I looked at their graves that were sort of similar to ours, but they were even, they had like multiple layers. Like, you know, ours is sort of, you know, just maybe one layer up, but they had multiple layers. And it was just powerful just to see how they even buried their dead. But I looked at this space and I thought it was powerful because that country is a, a colony, if you will, of the United States. And so what I noticed was if that was taken in Bermuda, what would be in the middle of that field? Not a baseball diamond, but a, a cricket pitch. The British influence. I'm talking about race, place, and complex space. Let me be honest with you, and I want to just make sure that I acknowledge my colleagues and the leadership and those who are in this room. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I stand on your shoulders, and I'm honored to be here. And I want to be honest with you. As I engage my work in the academy, I, I, I've accepted the reality that I'm not a traditional scholar. And that's okay. In fact, I be believe I represent uh, many amazing scholars who perhaps have never earned a PhD. I find that some of the most brilliant people I've met sit in barbershops, churches, neighborhoods, the brothers who are real scientists. And so when I engage in my work, I don't do what folks call alone research. I mean, that's good. I do do research. And this book is based on uh, an award-winning dissertation that, was now, that has now been modified. It's based on high-quality research. I'm honored to be able to have it in some of the top journals in my field. But the reality is I don't do just, me, just, just research. Because I believe that research is insufficient, particularly as it relates to the experiences and contacts of our people. And so I call what I do me search. Yeah, I, I, start with, I start with my story. I start with the reality that I, I shouldn't be here. You've traveled the island and you were, uh, uh, went to Bermuda College. That's about maybe two minutes away from my home where I grew up. And I visited that space yesterday for the first time in a long time. And I, I looked where there was now a big old house that has been built in a, a space that used to have a big hole in the backyard. In fact, I remember being a teenager with cricket dreams and basketball dreams and soccer dreams and, and wanted a, a space where I can play sport. But instead, there was a hole in my backyard that hadn't been filled. And in many ways, it reflected who I was and where I was at the time. I had a hole in my backyard. I had a hole in my heart. And it was powerful to navigate schools like Tucker's Nursery, who poured into me, and, and Pedro Primary School, where I grew up, and Bermuda, uh, Work Academy, and then to Bermuda College. I'm a proud graduate of Bermuda College. Bermuda College helped to heal me. Because in primary school, I felt like I could do anything. And in high school, there were questions, perhaps, from some who thought maybe I was average, <laughs> and had average ability, as was noted on a recommendation letter by a guidance counselor. So I, 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 I don't engage the same way that others do. I, I go back to Audrey and I'm excited about dapping up some of the guys who perhaps didn't have the same opportunities as me because of a transfer exam. They said, with my 6'7", I could go either Barclay or Work Academy. And with their transfer exam, perhaps they couldn't go there, but I wasn't better than them. I just had a mom who's here. Mom, thank you for being here. I call her Dr. Lucy Douglas because that's prophetic. I can't wait to sit on her committee if they allow me when she gets her PhD. And I also want to acknowledge Carrie Furbish. She is the first Bermudian graduate of the University of Missouri. She's a mentor of my, mentee of mine. Would you put your hands together for Ms. Carrie Furbish? We actually met when she was a freshman, and I saw that she was a Carifta athlete for Bermuda. And I reached out to her, and we've connected, going to her meet. She's come to my house, and now she's a part of our videography team, our, 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 the village, I call it. So grateful to have you here. And so I, 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 I just don't do work the same way that others do. And so I do what I call me search, looking at my story. And I want to challenge you to do the same. But we can't just stay with our stories because that would be selfish. That would be, you know, you know it's, it's, it's not about just us, right? We have to also push beyond that. And so I do also what I call research, where we take the best of what we've experienced and the challenges and begin to also look at the stories of others. And I believe that's what can allow us to be a border crossing brother scholar, or perhaps a border crossing leader, or a border crossing sister scholar, whatever you want to frame it. I want to share that with you, that what me search is about our stories, the, uh, the, the why. What's your why? I want to ask you some questions today. What's your why? 
What's your raison d'etre? What's your reason for the work that you're engaging in? Research allows us to also ask what's their story, right? The, the story of the others. What is your area of expertise, your passions? What's your what? But then research says, what is your our story, <laughs> right? With whom do you share intersecting stories, expertise, and passions? And then what's your work, your mission? So I want to give some context because as a researcher, this is a border crossing talk, so I want to respect the different folks in the room, scholars as well as practitioners, and so I'm going to move swiftly through some of this so you can know that the study was done with excellence and to provide context. We know that it's an interesting thing to uh, be a black male in this society. It's an interesting thing when we look at the reality that we have a black male president. And in this country, in Bermuda, you have, you've had uh, black male premiers like uh, 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 Craig Kennedy in, in the past, uh, uh, jo uh, uh, John... Uh, Swan, sorry, it's been a long time. Joan Swan, right? And other leaders, it's not, they're not the first, right? Other leaders. And yet and still, we also see that these leaders perhaps have not been able to, and I'm not just talking about them specifically, I'm talking about just systematically. You have black leaders, but yet the voices of black males still, I believe, teeter on what I will call oxymoronic baton. We hear them, but we don't hear them. And then we see the disturbing realities, the deficit-based notions that should reveal the underrepresentation of black males on college campuses and the overrepresentation of black males in the penal system and the challenges in our school systems. Father laws, and I'm not trying to uh, reify stereotypes, but these are some of the realities that don't just exist in the U.S., but we see them in Bermuda as well. We see them in, in, in Barbados. We see them in other countries around the globe. And so we must begin to ask some different questions, not of our black males alone, but of systems, understanding that people make decisions in context. I tell you, I'm no better than my friends. I just had a mom who said, before you can go outside and play football, you have to do your homework. I write books because my mom bought scholastic books for me. I didn't read them, but there was, a, there was this expectation that, hey, you need to read. <laughs> right? And that doesn't mean that the, these other parents should be disparaged. But for some parents, going back to a school is like returning to the scene of a crime. And so I didn't have the same opportunities, perhaps, as others, and I was blessed to get some access that others didn't have. And so I also want us to consider the context of race, that it's a social construct. In other words, it's made up. And I won't go too deeply into that because of time, but you should know that it's made up. It is. It's real and it's unreal. It's crazy, right? It is. And that the reality is that as we, as we engage in our identities across various contexts and countries and, and peoples and cultures, it plays out somewhat differently because it's unique. That black identity construction is unique and diverse. But as a subordinate identity within the dominant Eurocentric context, black identity has been produced in contradiction. We are in spaces where we we've been wanted and unwanted, invited and disinvited. And that black masculinities are complex and contested. I want to share the definition with you for your consideration. In the work that I do with my students, I try to get them to understand what racism, I believe, really is. And we define it as race prejudice, which all of us have. <laughs> we all have prejudices. But plus social and institutional power. Now, that's, that's different. Not all of us have the same access as relates to social and institutional power. You have to understand that the systems that we have in Bermuda and elsewhere were created when racism was overt. You had school systems that were birthed in the reality that black people were not fully human. Before you could earn property in the United States, you had to stop being property. And so I have to ask you to think about systems. I saw some, some comments to my article, to the article in the newspaper about Dr. Douglas, you misunderstood such, and things, such things about you know, black males, et cetera, because pe people just think it's just about the individual. No, I'm not eliminating the power of choice. But what I am saying is I made choices, and all of us make choices, based on context, based on systems that give access or not. I just want to also get us to consider the notion of, uh, of questioning the normal, right? of resisting the oppressor-victim dualism, that it's a lot, it's nuanced work, right? We're not necessarily saying we're victims, but we are saying, hey, there's some things that have affected our experience. Can you hear me? We have to understand that there is something called epistemic violence, the, the dismantling that needs to take place uh, because of the, the effect that's taking place on our minds. Some of us, when I say a particular name, you get an image that comes up. For example, I say Jesus, you see somebody that for many of you doesn't look like you. I was in Jamaica and I was at an all-black church and I see a, a sign on the outside and everybody, the angels, the people being saved, the, the, everybody there in the, on the, on the, on the uh, 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 image on the wall there was white. And, and no disrespect to my white brethren, but I'm concerned. I'm saying, so how does that connect to the people on the inside? Because we've been told the epistemic violence says somehow the answer is that salvation has to look like somebody lighter than us. 
And so the question that's related to this study was how do black comedian males cross metaphorical and literal borders and what are the implications of these processes for educational experiences and identity construction for black males across the diaspora. This is for the researchers in the room, traditional researchers in the room. You should know it's a qualitative study, 12 black comedian males between the ages of 30 and 40. We asked them questions like tell me the story of your, of your journey from birth to boyhood to manhood. We collected 38 hours of data and the participants were uh, what I call active participants in four community-based, one of four community-based pedagogical spaces. And community-based pedagogical spaces for me is just a fancy word for the folks who like dissertation language, right? But it's really the barbershop. People like Ricky Spence who poured into me, who drove me to my prom and drove me around on Monday as we went around the country and came to my PhD graduation. A leader, a man who facilitates literacy every day in the barbershop, who's earned a business for over 25 years but perhaps has never been considered an educator. Right? Why? Because, again, a Eurocentric model says you have to fit in these little paradigms. But as black folks and brown folks, we've always, that's what we do. We just bring stuff together and combine it to make it great. And so we have to begin to think about leaders in spaces like a barber shop, right? When a barber comes, you come to go into his chair, there's pedagogy, there's curriculum, there's a co-creation of something called a haircut. And you've got a black man with a razor close to your head. That takes some trust, don't you? <laughs> Teachers can learn from that. But they're also in spaces like churches and, and sports clubs and neighborhoods. And what would happen if there was a shared commitment and respect that honored the fact that men like Dennis Brown are pouring into our young man? That he's a leader, he's an educator. What would happen if we began to look at Warren Furbert as a principal at the Bermuda Regiment? What would happen if we began to think about these community spaces as just as powerful as the spaces inside of the schoolhouse? And so the framework for this study really focused on, in particular, uh, post-colonial theory and border theory, but there are other ideas that informed it, the, the notion of black male experience, the identity forming experiences, the institutional change, and ultimately better, trying to better understand black male identity. Again, this is for some of my scholars in the room, but it's certainly for everybody. I mean, I say scholars, I'm talking about all of us, but some people may be more familiar with this language. So border theory is a framework that, that really focuses on the notion that voices and identities live and are silenced within, across, and on geopolitical, social, cultural, and institutional borders and boundaries. Right? Border crossing is used to challenge colonial, post-colonial, center periphery binarisms. In other words, I use border theory to push us to think beyond borders. Like, think, think about it, 21 square miles, but every single day, we get to see eternity. Like, we see a, a skyline every day. Can you imagine that? We, 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 we constantly cross borders, and yet, we have young men on a 21 square mile island who can't go to Tarn, my Bermudian accent, or can't go to Somerset, and struggled across borders, right? So border theory was an appropriate context for this study, as was post-colonial theory, understanding the intra-cultural di cultural dynamics within. Because what happens when you have oppression, there's a lot that takes place within us. The self-hate that begins to develop, and we get to point guns at each other, but also we have to consider the systems that bring in guns and cause us at times, or encourage us at times, to perhaps do things that then we get blamed for. And I'm not eliminating choice, I'm just saying choice is made in context. And also the intercultural dynamics about how we engage with others who may not look like us. Post-colonialism is concerned with the legacy of colonialism to consider what, is, what life is like for those who have been both brutalized and constructed or shaped by those whose primary goal was the exploitation of resources. And so we must consider how do we deal with the translational and transnational dynamics of culture. You know, if you speak another language, you can say something in French, but there's still voice inflection and context and things that you say. If I say something right now, like, hey, man, I'm going off the road down to hear what you're saying. Most of you American folks are looking and say, what, what did he say? Is that pot or something, right? But in Bermuda, you know what that is. You know what a scrambler is, don't you? What is it? Is it something you beat eggs with, Bermudians? What is it? It's a bike, right? Translation of culture, right? And so we have to understand that, that language is contextual. And so some of the findings that emerged from this study, and I also want to sort of, uh, if you will, suggest some of the other things that have come from the work, because my work is now being translated, uh, trans, uh, trans, tri uh, triangulated globally. So the study started in Bermuda, that me search, huh, I have to. I have to understand me and my people before I can try to talk about other black folk and our experiences. And what I learned from that study is that uh, black males, and I believe in transcends race and culture, and social class, but we, are form, we form identities based on four key variables, if you look to the left, that are expectations, positive or negative. Experiences and experimentation, positive or negative. Exposure, positive or negative. And the expression of those identities, positive or negative. That's how we form identities. Now what happened with, the, with this NCAA, NCAA study, and that's not the focus of this talk, but I just want to just tease that out, and I have some work about that that many of you are going to be interested in, I know it. But I begin to now push, because I saw that the four variables from the first study were similar, 
and replicate it in the NCAA study, but the NCAA study also began to suggest, well, how do we also consider what it looks like for black males to flourish? To, to, to consider education, the what? To consider the environment, the where of where it takes place, your campus. Predominantly white spaces sometimes for black males coming from institutions or spaces where they've never engaged with, with white folks before. And now people are cheering for them, 70,000 people on a football field, but in the classroom they feel invisible. The economic empowerment piece, the earning power. How can we be about social uplift and not consider the economic variables? I have a colleague and mentor in the room who told me, hey, let's well, get into my PhD. Hey, listen, man, make sure you monetize, right? Make sure you monetize. Because it's about economics as well. How do you shift the context if you're not considering economics? And then the emigration process to what? Where are they going? So I want to introduce the voices of some of our men and the stories that I had the honor of hearing and sharing and learning from. I'll be honest with you, they taught me. Brilliant man, man who you may have never met. And they talk to us about things like, as on, the, on the expectations, the high expectations of self, or a, a corporate brother who did things the right way, went to the right schools, took the right exams, and worked hard for the company, and then found himself made redundant by a company who decided that a foreigner would be a better person in his position. And he was frustrated and, and at the time wondering, you know, how do I... How do I account for this when I've done things the right way and I've had high expectations and I've met them? And it was interesting because he was a person who at times mentioned how he struggled to connect with sort of the, the urban sort of, you know, grassroots movement. And it was amazing as I began to look at the data because he would say things and do things that were very similar to some of the guys he felt like he didn't maybe have a whole lot in common with. The street pharmacist who also was questioning the system. And it was amazing to see how the stories began to intersect. And then Daxter, who talked about shifting expectations and low expectations of, you know, being raised in a foster home. And in one area, you know, it was okay if you left your toys and, and you moved to another home. And now, uh, you know, leaving your toys is, is, is something that will get you licks. Or he talked about meeting his mother on Facebook and, and space in Bermuda, you know, being a, 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 back, a, a grocery packer uh, at a grocery store. And, and, and then someone introducing or sending somebody to let him know that his mother also was a cashier at that same grocery store and the embarrassment and shame that he felt of the expectations, how he just felt like, hey, listen, I just need to pass a class or just pass a test. I don't even want to go to one of the supposed academic schools. I just want to get by. I, I want to just sort of perform what they say you are when you're at this particular school. And it's amazing to hear how they describe the different schools. So I think that what's powerful about the book is that it begins to state some of the obvious things. Like we, 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 we know that there are pathways and we know that men went to different schools based on the transfer exam. But for the first time, we began to hear the voices of what those pathways meant, and Daxter shared a lot of that. It was powerful. Giovanni talked about working with other people's expectations, always got to do something for somebody else, trying to please mama, trying to please daddy. Kevin talked about unfulfilled expectations, so much potential. Malcolm talked about hard work, hard liquor, and hard losses, how the streets are, uh, and, and, the, and the bikes that I hope none of our guests choose to, 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 to rent, uh, mopeds. I hope you don't rent one, but if you do, be careful. But how many Bermudians have lost family members and how we often have to ride past the, past the very places where our loved ones lost their lives. Space, complex space, everyday reminder of the pain. Experiences and experimentation in community-based spaces. Kofi, you talked about unsupervised super, uh, uh, experimentation. Boys being boys. And uh, Shaka, who talked about surveillance and experimentation. That these gentlemen were navigating the sports club, and at times they were exposed to some stuff in the neighborhoods in the sports club. It's a space that could transition to represent your country in football, but it's also a space where for the first time somebody was exposed to illicit drugs, right? And they talk about that. They talk about some of the trips that they took on sports teams and the things that they experienced as they board across. Powerful voices of honest men. And Alan, who, who talked about this notion, an amazing gentleman, who, 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 who talked about how he, he, he was... Uh, you know, I, I, it's amazing because I remember the headlines, but this is a person who was vilified, if you will. In, in fact, his narrative is often framed as, as sort of a linchpin in what some would describe as a proliferation of, of gang violence in Bermuda, in that he was seen on the front page of the newspaper and uh, brandishing a weapon, and, uh, and, and how the media, he says, you know, framed it was different from what he understood was taking place. He was defending his brother, and the media thought he was a part of a gang, and he talked about that, and he talked about his prison experience and how he was transformed in a prison talked about how the prison experience was the very first time that he had the opportunity to just stop, reflect, and think. And I sat down with a man who was gentle and kind and powerful and brilliant. And I thought, wow, man, an amazing brother. And I also thought, as he shared with me, that he was a gumbe. Some of you don't know what a gumbe is just yet. 
But Agumbe is a part of uh, the cultural heritage of Bermuda. It's an African dance troupe, and he talked about how he teaches Gumbe. And I began to think about how we could draw a pedagogy from Gumbe dancing. What does it look like? And he talked about how, when he's a Gumbe, how he would just flow. And he talked about how you know, he, would, he, would, he would do something you know, called the, the, the masquerade, the masquerade dance. And I've been a part of many community-based spaces. I've been a part of sports club, the barbershop, the neighborhood, the church. But I can't do the masquerade like him, but I did have a question. How do we create spaces where young men can just stop outside the prison? And how do we allow young men in classrooms with a course where they're asked to sit down for hours to just flow? So I want you to consider what does that look like, the masquerade, as one of our gumbe should share this with us real quick. Would you come, gentlemen? Sir, yes, sir. Now, if you really know what you're doing, you'll throw some money like Mr. Moss in the day, and you'll say, Ayo, Ayo, Ayo. Put your hands together for these community leaders, these educators. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. This is Mr. Dennis Parsons. Mr. Dennis Parsons, would you put your hands together? <laughs> gentlemen, would you just come? Just Tell the folks your name, which you got. I don't want to even just speak for you. Just tell them your name real fast, could you? It's a little out of breath. <laughs> My name's Keyroy Butterfield. Yeah, put your hands together for Mr. Keyroy Butterfield. Uh, My name's Dennis Parsons. Yeah, put your hands together for these gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. I just think it's important for you to hear their voices. I don't want to speak for them, but they are amazing leaders uh, in our community. Thank you, gentlemen. As I transition to my clothes, I just want to also share with you the power of exposure, the breadth of exposure. We had lots of participants who also talked about the complicated but uncomplicated nature of being in Bermuda. Uh, some of them who had West Indian heritage and some of the tensions that exist, you know, as it relates to uh, our West Indian communities and, and, and Bermudians and, and how they were perhaps called names like Jump Up because they were, had Jamaican heritage and some of the tensions that exist within the intracultural dynamics that was powerful and being dark-skinned men. We also talked about the reality of this notion that Bermudians like to drink. I want to just share that with you. Some of you, I'm sure you've been offered some rum sizzle well, at some point already. If you haven't, I'm sure somebody will. But I also began to ask questions about why is it that we, that we love to drink so much as black Bermudian males? Is it possible that some of that could also be a cover up for our pain? It, do we really like to drink or is it just more socially acceptable? Is that part of our cool pose to just, you know, B, you know what I mean? Have a toddy. Is it tough, more, more difficult to be sober, right? And not just in Bermuda, but in Baltimore and St. Thomas, where, you know, it's a similar thing. And so I want us to think about now success. And I'm transitioning to a close. I won't be with you much longer. But our definitions of success, and many of them talked about stuff like, well, hey, don't worry, be happy, you know? Um, family, uh, want to be good fathers, you know, financial security to take care of generations. That included the brother in the book who you know, had eight children by seven different baby mamas who had a very similar sort of ideological perspective to the corporate guy who thought he did things the right way. And the brother who was seen as a street pharmacist and how they had similar ideologies but just how they went about the system and the systems that they questioned were very similar. 
because he also sees particular leadership organizations as gangs. So it's interesting to see friendship and fun, fulfillment of their potential and faith. I began to think about people like Johnny Barnes. For those of you who are here for the first time, I'm fortunate you will get a chance to meet Mr. Barnes in person, but you'll see his statue as you drive on East Broadway, an amazing man, a leader, who every single day, whether it was a hurricane coming or if it was bright and sunny, was outside waving and saying to the people, I love you. I love you. Bermuda. But I also began to think about his story and his ideals also in the context of what I heard from the participants who talked about this notion of being perhaps passive, laid back, docile, to describe black community males. And many of them also embraced sort of eight, uh, atypical notions of black masculinity. In other words, they weren't necessarily about domination. This was, this was, this was guys who were, were about collaboration. But I also thought about the reality that there was a new generation of black males who perhaps aren't so comfortable just smiling and waving like Johnny Bonds' generation. They're not just comfortable with just making tourists comfortable. They, they, they actually want to be heard in different ways. And it was interesting because they used oxymoronic overtures like, you know, no, it, it, it wasn't hard, but it wasn't easy growing up. Or the uncomplicated nature, or, or unplica uncomplicated but complicated. One participant, brilliant, brother said, he talked about Bermuda, and he said, man, he said, we are suffering and smiling. He talked about the reason we're suffering and smiling is because we know what we're watching on TV and we know what we're going to eat for dinner, but we will, we will smile because that's what we've been cultured to do, but we're, st we're suffering. And I thought about this in the context of the research that I found where we talked about the happy situation of the Bermudian Negro. And I found a, 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 a quote in the book uh, by Bernard, and it says, in a letter in 1722, Governor Hope notes, no slaves in the West Indies are used so well as the Negroes are here in Bermuda. These Negroes are all, are all sensible of the happy situation they are in. If you notice, Bermuda is a little bit different as it relates to other Caribbean contexts and other islands. It's, it's, a, it's a bit more affluent, right? And so there were tensions that emerged in the data where guys are saying, you know, sometimes as Bermudians, we probably think that we're a little bit better than some of our Caribbean brothers, and we want to make sure we do whatever we can to make sure Master don't take his trinkets. And it connects to the, to the narrative of this brother who said, listen, man, it's a, it, we're suffering and smiling. We're, 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 you know, we're, we're struggling, but, but, but we're, we're, we're also you know, acting like everything's okay. And I thought it was interesting when it connected to the narrative from Bernard. They also talked about the sports club. This is Kofi who said, until the age of 31, I was an alcoholic. At 19, we were introduced to marijuana. I remember my cousin coming around with the marijuana. Prior to then, I remember trying, uh, uh, telling him clearly, I would never do drugs. No, because then the slogan, this was in school, said no to drugs, say no to drugs, and it was reinforced. So I think school did a good job at that point, but he struggled when the messages of the schoolhouse were quieted by the realities of lived experience, and now the pressures of educational spaces like the sports club came to the floor. He talked about this notion of being uh, a Bermudians like to drink, and how it's almost like this uns unspoken, well, it's actually spoken, it's a song, um, but this, this almost a second motto or, 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 or national song for many. And that the slogan and culture that is almost accepted by Bermudians, that it's become a norm, right? That, 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 that we, we, we use alcohol perhaps as a means of, of quieting our pain. And I'm closing now, and I just want you to think about the power of the complexity. I've talked a lot about complex spaces, and I'll be honest with you, I believe that complexity is one of the most important ingredients for ingenuity and creation. And as I've engaged in this work at the University of Missouri and challenged my students, some of them who have never had a black educator before until me, and I began to ask them to ask different questions about systems that have privileged them and systems that have allowed them to not see what's right in front of their noses in George Orwell's words. I'll never forget last semester, I was teaching an educational leadership class, and this is on the back end of everything that took place in the fall, and I had an amazing group of diverse students from all across the world, seven different countries represented, and three uh, white students. There were no native or, or, or uh, domestic African-American students in the class, which I thought was interesting. And I remember on the first class, I was excited about my syllabus. I, I mean, I thought it was an amazing syllabus, and it was. But at the end of the first class, after pouring into them and sharing them a framework about, you know, this whole idea of me search, research, and research, I mean, they were, they were loving it. We were feeling it. But there were two students who stayed behind after class, one international student, one Caucasian gentleman. And they both asked, you know, this question that I thought was interesting. Well, you know, Dr. Douglas, you know, I noticed on your syllabus we're reading uh, some work from a lot of different uh, uh, people of color, you know, a lot of black folks. Is that, is that typical? Is that what they do at the University of Wisconsin-Madison? I had, took the privilege to look at other syllabi across the country, and I don't see many other scholars who are using that literature. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Have you ever asked any of your white professors why there's an absence of black scholars on their syllabi? I thought it was interesting that he would ask that. And it was a powerful ex exchange. And these gentlemen had transformational experiences in my class. But I'll be honest with you, I went home wrestling. 
I was frustrated because I'm saying, wow, like these guys, man, they, they wow, like they, that's fine, they're crashing. It's about crashing. I'm good. But with everything that took place in the fall, you still don't want to talk about it? And I had two students in my classroom, one who, she was an international student who, you know, bragged about how she was learning English and how she, you know, would, would, would use, uh, she watched hundreds of episodes of Friends to learn English. And I thought, wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. That says something. She didn't say, I watched hundreds of episodes of, let's say, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I had an amazing gentleman who was from an Asian country. I'm not saying that to sort of generalize Asia, but I just want to keep it general uh, for anonymity. But, and he had this amazing name, but he wanted me to call him John. Not Jamico or Jermichael or Jolando, but John or a gym type name, right? Because some of us have names like Tyron that suggest when I walk in a room, folks are like, I know that's a brother, right? <laughs> but I thought it was interesting that the default choice for him was something that ref reflected Eurocentrism. And I wanted to ask them to consider that. And it led me to something that I think is going to help us in this room, and I'm closing. This idea of not just research, research, but research. But I discovered as my campus leader struggled to navigate some of the things that were taking place on our campus, that if you haven't done research, research, and research, then you can never get to this concept that I believe is an emerging and dynamic concept that was given to me. I believe is, 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 is prophetic. But the notion of free search. That when you do the requisite work of looking at yourself and your story, and you begin to look at the research and look at the story of others, it can be liberating in a way that allows you to engage with others that perhaps you could not previously engage with. And that's what happened as I began to engage with my grandfather, a brilliant carpenter. Henry Thomas was his name. I study and research about black males in part because of this gentleman, a man who lived across from me in a garden that was not very large, but it felt like acres because of the breach between our relationship. I didn't understand why he didn't want to show me his carpentry skills. And yesterday, as I walked in the property and saw that the hill in the backyard has been replaced by a building that he never saw, I thought about also his perspective as I walked across what was a garden that is now grass and a yard and looked from his house with dilapidated blinds and a moonlight, moon, uh, moonlight uh, 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 brick structure that he handcrafted. Brilliant. Mathematician, art slope, Mr. Matthews, Dr. Matthews. But was broken down now as he lays in the grave. And I thought, whoa, what was his perspective of me? Little privileged little boy going from Pedro Primary to Work Academy as he looked across at me and went to a job that he did not really like as a carpenter, brilliant, brilliant as he was. But as he told me a story, he said he was not allowed to attend the Barclay Institute because even though he got the second highest school on the entrance exam, and for those of you who are not Bermudian, the Barclay Institute um, is an elite uh, accident school that was the uh, historically uh, uh, black school, um, and uh, it still is. But at the time, he was not allowed admission to that exam because he was told, and this is his story, that he was deemed as illegitimate. His parents were not married when he was born. And I should that not to throw anybody under the bus, but to challenge us because there are men who are walking around society who, have, who feel illegitimate. Some of us in this room feel illegitimate with PhDs. You heard the promo video. And I wrestled with the reality of my grandfather, who I began to understand in a new way as he began to share his story with me. That it really wasn't even about me. He was hurting and he was broken. I had the honor and privilege of our relationship being mended before he passed. And he began to share his life with me and how smart he was. And I loved listening to his football stories. And unfortunately, it took place towards the end of his life. He was diagnosed with um, some type of kidney failure. And it caused his eyes to look like what you see in the picture. Jaundice was setting in. But this is what began to really change me. I looked in his eyes one day and I said, Papa, what's going on with your eyes, man? He said, what are you talking about? I'll I, 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 I see what you're talking about. What do you mean? I said, your eyes, like the banana yellow. Talk to me. What's going on with your eyes? And he said something to me that I want to challenge you with as we embark on this conference, this colloquium, but also on the work that we're called to do across this nation and across this globe. He said to me, he said, Ty, I have not looked in my eyes in years. Dr. Moore, I asked to myself, how is it a man could take off his glasses every single day or brush his teeth or shave? Sharp looking, dark skinned male who I saw at times drink himself pale. But meetings don't like to drink, just in pain. And when he said that to me, I looked into his eyes, I could have another level of compassion and courage when I held his hand as he closed his eyes, still fighting on the table. They had to hold him down because he wanted to live. And our sons, they want to live. 
But he has sons and grandsons and others who, who, who aren't able to live because our school systems, our structures perhaps aren't given the opportunities. And we also have to give them the, the, the skill sets so they can navigate these systems. So I want to offer you, teachers in the room, a, a new vision. Because when you do free search and you add that to teach, I call the work that we're about to do, call, I call that freech. Don't just teach, I need you to freech. You're a leader. I don't want you just to do leadership. When you, add, when you do the free search and you connect that to leadership, then we can do what I call freedership. And as you go back to your campus, and as you get engaged in this fifth annual colloquium, you know, stuff gets real official after you're like five. This is, well, this is not just like some fly-by-night thing. This is an annual colloquium. They've been to Jamaica and Atlanta and other places all across this globe. And Bermuda, we're here. And Bermuda's a special place. Would you agree, folk? Great things happen here. We still, we, I told the students yesterday, we are rare and exceptional. Did you know that? 65,000 people are missing a 300 million population, and yet we produce Flora Duffy and Sean Godas and leaders across this world. How do you do that? Hurricanes come and we don't flinch. I want to be here when a hurricane comes. I'm going to lie to you. I don't want to be in North Carolina or Missouri. I don't. You know why? Because people like my grandfather who never got a school, a high school degree. Another brilliant man who perhaps had to put aside schoolhouse dreams to take care of siblings to pay for their schoolwork. They built our houses. Mathematicians who never got a PhD like Dr. Matthews and myself. But who designed a house with water catchment systems and, 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 and slate on the roof and, 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 and uh, alkali that would neutralize the acidity of the rain into a water catchment system underneath your house. That's brilliant. And we need our students to recognize that. And I, I embrace it fully. You know why? Because I continue to navigate a world, even with my PhD, where I must prove that I'm real and exceptional. I'm currently engaged in a professional process called promotion and tenure. Where I have to prove, literally, that my case is rare and truly exceptional. Navigating contacts and spaces that sometimes don't understand what your service or your teaching really looks like. Or even your research. And I have to assure myself, as you saw that picture, in the book trailer, in my office one day, and I heard in my spirit, it doesn't matter what other people think or say. You've always been real and exceptional. I want to charge you and challenge you. You are real and exceptional, Bermuda. You are real and exceptional. Black males, white males, you know, uh, white women of color, white women, whomever you are in this room, you're real and exceptional. That there is a human fabric that underlines I have a passion for humanity at this point. I'm sick of seeing people hurting. And I want to challenge you to be real and exceptional because you always have been. And that's what I heard in my spirit. Not just because it was some, you know, hi, you know, hyperbole or some line in my brain. But because the story is this. I didn't have a crystal stare and life wasn't always easy. In fact, I shouldn't be here. You're looking at real and exceptional. Mom was a 19-year-old college freshman when she was pregnant with me. And when I talk about her getting a PhD, it's not really just about me, I promise you. It's about every single teenage mother, every single father, every single young man who didn't know his father like me, looked at your father in the casket and wondered well, what, what you had in common with daddy. It's for you. My mom told me a story, and I had the PhD, I think, at the time, or at least I was doing pretty well in school. But there were still some things that weren't quite whole because I needed to understand some stuff about my journey. And she shared with me something that changed my life. She said, well, son, here's the reality. She said, I was 19, and I found myself at a lonely abortion clinic in Huntsville, Alabama thinking to do the unthinkable. And she said at that moment, she was in the abortion clinic, and she said for the very first time, I felt a flutter in my stomach and knew I couldn't do it. We're an exceptional. And so I speak for every child and every dream that was eliminated in the abortion clinic. I'm really an exceptional because many kids don't make it out of that abortion clinic. And there are some moments, folk, where you have to move. Your life, your destiny depends on it. Young men, black males across this country and across this globe don't need us to come here and spend 200, 300, some of us may have charged $500 for a room and to just put something on a CV. Young scholars, this is not just about a presentation for your conference uh, 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 dossier. This is about young men who need us to activate our work now. You are not average, you're real and exceptional. So as I close, here's my question to you. What's your story? What's your why? What's the research? Your, what, what are you called to do? What's your what? What is your, uh, the research? What's our, your story? And if you're going to become a border crossing leader, what's your win? With whom can you strategically collaborate? What borders must you cross? What bridges or capacity must you build to provide access and opportunity for all? How will you mobilize, listen to me, monetize and market your mission? Not just about money, but your mission, the mission for maximum community and educational impact. The book 
that I have in my hands that I was honored to release to my people first, that I hope would become a New York bestseller, not because of me, but because we need to begin to export, not just be importers, is a book that the publishing company wanted to charge $52.95 for. That's systems of oppression. So I had to fight, get it down to $42.95, Dr. Moore, and then get it down to $38 because I could carry the books myself and bring them home so that folks could get access to them. That's border crossing brother scholarship. That's real and exceptional. And I'm not the only one. And so as we engage in the fifth annual colloquium on black males in education, may this be the beginning of something special that reverberates across this globe because our sons, fathers, brothers, uncles are relying on us. Thank you for your time.